Hello, I'm Sean from the UKRI International Development Team and I'm the lead for the Interdisciplinary Research Hubs call and I have today with me my colleague Anne. Hi there, I'm Anne and I work with Sean on the International Development Team and I lead on the college. Thank you very much for joining us today. So we're going to get started with the presentation and you should now be able to see the slides so that you can follow along with us. We're going to start with a little bit of background about the uh, Interdisciplinary Research Hubs call and then go through some key elements around the peer review process and how to navigate the system. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Interdisciplinary Research Hubs call, this is the second collective fund call delivered by UKRI under the Global Challenges Research Fund. And it's a call to support large-scale interdisciplinary programmes of eight to 20 million pounds each over five years. And all of these should be collaborative with a range of appropriate international partners. So to help frame the uh, hubs call, we have the sustainable development goals. And in particular, there's a focus on the complex intractable challenges which sit across and between these different goals. So what we're looking for is programmes which take a more holistic approach rather than tackling smaller sub-challenges or sub-questions. And in order to achieve this, we're asking researchers and their partners to think beyond the traditional disciplinary partnerships that individuals might work in and consider ways in which a broader range of disciplines and individuals can contribute to be able to address these challenges. And in particular, we're asking people to consider the broader context and the factors surrounding these challenges and how those might affect the ability to address them and shape the solutions that are created. So we don't expect all hubs to look exactly the same, but what we are looking for is for them to all demonstrate the following characteristics. And these are around a challenge and impact focus, identifying an interdisciplinary approach which takes insights from a range of disciplines and communities, that they have substantial, genuine and meaningful global partnerships, both within academia and with non-academic partners, and particularly important for investments and projects of this scale, we're looking for consideration of organisation and leadership within the programme. And all of these factors are uh, reflected in the assessment criteria, which we'll talk about a little later on. So that's a quick overview of the hub's call. But next, we're going to talk about the review process in more detail and go through these elements in order. So first of all, just to help you orientate yourselves a little, this is an idea of the timeframes that we're working with for this call. So we have the form proposal call closing in a few days time where the applicants will submit their proposals and following that we'll take uh, a number of office checks, sort of administrative checks, before sending the proposals out to you for peer review. So you'll receive official invitations through our JES system uh, between June and July and those reviews will go out to the applicants themselves to comment on before uh, your reviews and their responses go to the assessment panel in September this year. Following that assessment panel, we will uh, cut down the number of proposals and a selection of them will be taken forward to the interview stage, which will take place in October, where the final decisions will be made about which proposals to fund. So one of the key things for peer review is uh, to consider conflicts of interest. And this is where we think about what could be perceived as factors that might bias a review. So this isn't about whether you as individuals feel uh, able to complete an unbiased review, but it is about the potential perceptions from external individuals and organisations. So we at UKRI aim to identify all of the conflicts of interest that we can, but there may be some things which we can't identify uh, because they're not obvious from the information we have about you and the proposals up front. 
So we would urge you to think about where you might have a conflict and to contact us as soon as you can and preferably before completing your review because we don't want you to waste time and effort in reviewing a proposal uh, where we believe you have a conflict. And in terms of what we consider as conflicts of interest, you can see the list here. So this is if you are at the same institution as an applicant or you yourself are named as an applicant. If you're a close relative or have a close personal tie to any of the applicants named in the proposal. If you're a close collaborator and you have an active collaboration or you've published with applicants named in the bid in the last three years. If you've been the PhD student of or supervisor of one of the named applicants in the last 10 years. Or for this call, if you've been uh, named as an applicant on another proposal submitted. So in summary, essentially, you would be conflicted if you were an applicant yourself or if you have a personal or professional relationship with one of the applicants named. So as I say, once you've been invited to review, we would recommend that you have a look through uh, the proposal to identify any potential conflicts of interest that we might have missed. And the proposal pro forma is a good place to look for these because this will list all of the applicants and the project partners in the proposal. And once you've had a look through, if you do have any concerns about anything that may be a conflict, please do contact us as soon as possible and we can clarify for you. So now I'm going to hand you over to Anne for a bit more information and some hints and tips about writing a good review. Uh, thank you, Sean. Yes, in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about how to write a useful review. On this slide, you will see four points mentioned, and we are asking that you bear these in mind when you write your review. So the first point mentioned is that as a reviewer, we see your task is to provide a report that will help the panel reach a decision about the grant application. And when your review clearly sets out the strengths and the weaknesses of the application in relation to the assessment criteria, this then helps the panel make a decision. Later on in this webinar, Sean will talk in more detail about the assessment criteria for the full proposals. And also, point three, you should make a clear recommendation as to whether or not you think the application is fundable. And finally, please bear in mind that the applicant, who we sometimes refer to as the principal investigator or the PI, will receive your anonymized review so they can respond to it and any concerns you've raised in it. And the panel will also take the PI's response into their considerations. So, we have a list of do's and don'ts to bear in mind when you start writing your review. And for you on this slide, we have some do's. So do read the assessment criteria. Do make sure you're familiar with the grading scale and the scores and the descriptors. Do make sure you're objective, fair and professional. Please provide full, clear and concise comments and any criticism, please make it objective. Clearly identify strengths and weaknesses. Provide a justification for your comments and your grade, making sure you indicate whether you're supportive of the proposal or not. Be aware that not everyone reading your comments in your review will be a specialist in the field. And be aware of any unconscious bias. We sent you out earlier a brief about unconscious bias for college members. You might like to refer to that. And also for those of you who took part in the unconscious um, bias webinar, I hope you've hel found that helpful as well. And finally, we ask you to treat all information as confidential. In the next slide, we get, get onto the don'ts. So these are the things you shouldn't do. So don't make it personal. Don't reiterate the proposal or restate the assessment questions. And don't include anything that can identify you or, and who you are. That could be references to your work, where you have worked or who you have worked with. And please don't exceed the space restriction in JESS, or that part that exceeds it will be lost. We won't see it or the panel. And finally, don't allow your review to be influenced by bias for your own field of research. So in the next slide, there are some questions that you might find helpful to ask yourself as you write your review. So 
How important are the research questions or gaps in knowledge that would be addressed in the proposal? Is the proposal novel, innovative and timely? What about the researchers, the whole management team? Are they up to the job? Do they have the right team, the right people, the right experience? And what about the infrastructure? Are they at the forefront of the research internationally and nationally? And again, the strengths and weaknesses of the proposal, what are they? What about the methodology and exper experimental design? Is it clearly set out and justified? Are the methods appropriate? What could the team do better? And are there alternative approaches? Are there any major flaws and weaknesses? Are there any ethical issues? And what about good value for money? Does this proposal represent good value for money? If you bear these questions in mind, they will help guide your review. OK, we have a handout available for you that you should be able to download very shortly as part of this webinar. Here you go, that should be available to you now. And if you're not able to download it now, it's also available on the Peer Review College pages of the UKRI website. Right, what we're going to do now is to have a poll where we ask for your thoughts. Um, we'll look at some real examples that we've received of reviewer comments. And then after each example, we'll ask you what you think. You'll have 30 seconds to submit your thoughts. So what do you think? Is this reviewer comment true or false? It's all about consistency. It's really important that I'm consistent with my comments and grades. Please vote now. Okay, and the answers this time around are 83% of the audience believe it's true and 17% believe it's false. Well, thank you very much for voting in that. The correct answer is true. And on the next screen, there's a little bit more explanation for why this is the, good, the true answer. We say it's a good approach and it's important to bear in mind how your review will be used. It will be fed back anonymously to the applicant who will then have the opportunity to respond to any criticism or whatever you've highlighted in your review. And that will then go on to the panel along with your review and the other reviews. And that will help the panel to, to uh, distinguish between the proposals, to distinguish between the ones that are good and the ones that are excellent. So it's really crucial that your feedback is consistent and also fair. Right, we'll now go on to the second reviewer comment on, and the second question in the poll. So, what do you think? Is this comment true or false? As a reviewer, I need only to identify the weakness in a proposal so that the panel can understand how strong the proposal is. Please vote now. True or false, you have 30 seconds. Okay, and we had 100% in favour of false. Fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. The correct answer is false. So thank you very much for that. Right, the explanation for this is it's important you clearly identify the main strengths and weaknesses in a proposal because the hardest part of a panel's job is to separate the truly excellent proposals from the ones that are just very good. So they need your advice to help them. We'll now continue to the third comment and the third and question and the final question in the poll. Right, what do you think? And this time we're asking you to reply either useful or not useful. Right, the real comment is, this is an excellent application in an important area and the combination of experimental and theoretical methods is a key strength. However, the work plan lacks detail leaving me unclear if Work Package 3 is needed. I also doubt if Work Package 4 can be fully completed, but I don't think this is an issue. Impact has been well described and excellent project partners have been identified. Please vote now, you have 30 seconds. Okay, so the answer this time, 62% uh, of the audience felt that the review was useful and 38% felt that it was not useful. Okay, thank you very much. As you can see from the next slide, the correct answer in this case is useful. And that's because this is the preferred style of reviewer comment. 
Applications will have both strengths and weaknesses. This comment brings out both and indicates their relative importance and where appropriate balances them out against the other. This gives the panel members the maximum amount of useful advice to support them in making a decision. Now this is the end of the section on how to write a useful review and we hope that you now have a good idea of how you can do that. Right, we're now going to move on to just for reviewers and what happens if you get invited to submit a review. Right, um, all reviews have to be submitted through JESS, the Joint Electronic Submission Systems. And if we have matched and selected you as a potential reviewer to a grant proposal, you'll receive an email inviting you to assess the proposal. A summary of the proposed research is attached to the email, so please make sure you open the attachment and read this carefully, because that will help you determine if the proposal is within your field of expertise and if you feel competent to review it. The email will also tell you what to do if you wish to decline the invitation or if you wish to request an extension because normally we give you three weeks to write the review in and to submit it. Right. If you read the summary and you think that you could only review part of the proposal because it's a multidisciplinary proposal, that might be okay. But please contact the office to discuss. We can then find another reviewer to review the part of the proposal that's without your expertise area. Okay, we're now going to go on to Jess for reviewers in terms of navigating Jess. And that's because we've had quite a few questions from our college members about navigating Jess. So we thought this webinar would be a really good opportunity to go through Jess and show you what you will see in Jess as a reviewer. So, Many of you will already be familiar with the JESS login page because we've asked you to set up a JESS account and we also ask you to add in your research expertise. Just a really quick reminder and say thank you if you've already added your expertise and if you haven't done so already, please do so. It really helps us when we select reviewers. Right, after you've logged in, then in the navigation column on the left, you need to click on Documents, and this is what the grey arrow is showing you. After you've clicked through, you can see, whether, again, where the grey arrow indicates, there's the peer review hyperlink. And if you click on this, you will get through to the peer review pages. But please note, if this is the first time you are completing a review for us, you will be asked to accept the review protocols before you can proceed to see the review. And that's something that uh, applies to all people who do reviews for UKRI. Right, so you've uh, clicked through and you will see all reviews that are awaiting your attention. You can choose the one you want to look at by clicking the open hyperlink next to the review. And that's again what the grey arrow is showing you. So, you've clicked through to a proposal, and this is the next screen with all the proposal documentation. Just a quick note here, that the screenshots provided are for an EPSRC review. Reviews for other councils will have a different logo and colour at the top of the screen, but that's just a minor difference. So, let's just have a look at the screen on this shot. So, there are mandatory sections, and they are marked with a red cross, showed by the grey arrow. Once you've completed one of the mandatory sections, the, gray, the red cross will become a green tick, signifying you've done that bit. And once, and only once, you've completed all the mandatory uh, sections, well, you have the option to submit, and the submit button will appear. Another really important point on this screen is if you see where the red arrow is pointing, this is a countdown of how long you have to complete the review before the system will automatically lock you out. Now, this is only the time you have in Jazz. It's a timed session. It doesn't mean you just have two hours, you have three weeks. But for that reason, you may wish to use Word or another application to complete your review and then copy the information into Jazz when you've completed it. To download a copy into Word, you can use the document actions, see the yellow arrow, which the menu there, and select print document. And then you can work outside Jazz and then upload your review into Jess. Right, on that same Jess page, 
You can either navigate using the document menu, see where the grey arrow is pointing, to navigate through the document, and again where the yellow arrow is showing. You can use the previous and next buttons, or once you've completed each section, you can press save at the top of the page, and then you can move on to the next section. If you've got any questions for one of the sections, you, have, you can press on the question button next to the section and that will give you further guidance on how to complete it. And that's what the blue arrow is indicating. Right. On that same page where you can now see a bit more, I've moved the text boxes. In the instructions indicated by the grey arrow, if there are any specific instructions from the Research Council, UKRI, they will be provided here. So please make sure you always check this part. And then the red arrow shows you the list of documents that you need to consider in order to complete your review. So this is the, all the bits of the proposal that are here. What we advise is that you read the pro forma first to help you determine whether the proposal is within your field of expertise. If it is not within your expertise, you can use the decline to review option at the bottom of the document, document menu on the left. That's the yellow arrow showing you that. But again, as I said, if it is partially within your expertise and you can review part of the application, please let us know and just get in touch with us to discuss. Right. As you work your way through the sections with the red crosses in the document menu on the left, they will turn to green ticks as shown by the yellow arrow. The last section for you to complete will be the overall assessment section. You can see the text box here. And you have 6,900 characters maximum. And that's what the grey arrow is showing you. Please don't exceed this maximum because we will not see it and neither will the panel or the applicant. It will simply be deleted. Now, once you've completed the full review and all the red crosses have turned to green ticks, that means you've completed your review and you can submit it. You will then see, as indicated on this slide by the yellow arrow, that a submit document button has appeared. If you click this button, your review will be submitted. All right. We have this uh, whole presentation of Jess available as a handout now. You can go again go to the UKRI website and the college page and it's also available on there. If it's not available today, it'll be available very, very soon. Thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to Sean, who will go through the assessment criteria in more detail. Thank you, Anne. So we've mentioned assessment criteria a few times already. Um, and for all activities, these should be published as part of the call documentation. And they're there in part to inform the applicants about what they will be assessed against, but also to help guide uh, you as the reviewer and also the panel uh, in their comments and their recommendations. So we recommend that reviewers use the criteria as a guide, but obviously you're welcome to go beyond these where appropriate. So if there's something in particular that you think it's important to raise, you can include that even if it's not explicitly mentioned in the assessment criteria. And building on what Anne said, you may feel that you're not able to comment on all of these criteria in the same level of detail, and that's not a problem, but what we ask is that you make sure it's clear in, the view, in your review any areas where you're not commenting or you feel you don't have the expertise to comment in as great detail. So we're now going to go through each of these assessment criteria in slightly more detail and cover some of the questions which might help guide you in creating your reviewer comments. So the first criteria around strategic rationale is essentially about why the team are proposing to do the work. So here you should ask yourself if the proposal is challenge-led, whether the applicants have justified why this scale of activity is required, and if they've made a convincing case that this work would add value in the context of the other research and activities that are going on. In terms of research excellence, it's important to consider whether the research is novel and timely, but also whether it's well integrated and whether you feel there's significant potential for it to advance the field. 
So the next two criteria are more focused on who will be involved in the programme. Firstly, thinking about the skills and the expertise of the research team and whether they have access to the appropriate data, resources and tools that they're going to need to carry out the work. And then in terms of the partnerships more broadly, thinking about whether they're appropriate, if there are any key players missing, whether the partnerships seem genuine, and if you think that these partnerships collectively will support capacity building uh, within those partnerships, but also in the countries more generally. So next up, recognising the importance of impact within the Global Challenges Research Fund, we'd like you to consider whether the applicants have outlined a clear plan for how they will ensure that the research that they're proposing will lead to a range of different impacts. And it's important here that they demonstrate a sufficient understanding of the local context and the ability to uptake any potential solutions and implementations. And also it's important that they've considered how they can make their program sustainable. So that's in terms of leveraging activity and impact and inputs beyond the grant, but also how things like capacity building and resources can be sustained and strengthened beyond the ward as well. So next up are some criteria around leadership and management. So if you remember, this was one of the core principles and characteristics underlying what a hub is. And we're keen that the applicants have appropriately identified individuals with the skills and expertise required to manage uh, and implement a program of this scale and complexity. And that there's a good balance of leadership and management across the partnership. Given that these are five-year awards, we're also looking to see evidence that there's flexibility to the plan so that they can adapt and evolve over time. So continuing with this theme around management, it's also important that they identify a suitable plan for financial management, risk management, governance and the like. And that also they have a sensible plan for monitoring and evaluating their progress and milestones and monitoring for their outputs. In terms of ethics, this can include quite a wide, rate, wide range of elements, including things like the health and safety of researchers and partners, but also about the ethics and the equality of the partnerships more generally. <coughs> and about uh, any work <coughs> such as um, human participation studies or use of animals that may have specific ethical implications. In terms of the value for money, for something of this nature it can be quite difficult to look through and justify in, or uh, to assess the justification for individual costs. But what we would like you to do is to highlight any costs which you think look unusually high or low uh, or anything you feel that the applicants haven't fully explained uh, what the money is for. Also considering the kind of overall feel for whether the total sum of money requested feels in line with the potential impacts and outputs. So hopefully that's not too overwhelming. We're aware that there are quite a lot of questions there that you might want to consider, but hopefully they provide a useful guide as you start to think about um, the strengths and weaknesses of the proposals you're reviewing. And as Anne said, you will have to select an overall score for the proposal, and this should reflect your overall conclusion and be supported by the comments made within your review. So just to kind of highlight this, at one extreme, we wouldn't expect a review that only contains information about the weaknesses and major concerns to score a six. And at the other end of the scale, a review that only identifies strengths and is wholly positive, we wouldn't expect to score a one. So finally, in summary, just a reminder that your expert comments will be used by the panel to inform their recommendations. Uh, and as such, you should identify both the strengths and the weaknesses you've identified and give a clear recommendation as to whether overall you would consider the proposal, the proposal 
fundable in principle. And again, just a reminder that your comments will be shared as written with the applicants. So hopefully you will have found this information useful and if you haven't already downloaded the links or looked uh, on the website you can find additional guidance there uh, relating to various aspects of reviewing. And also as mentioned this webinar and the slide sets will be available shortly again on that website should you want to revisit any of the sections. So we do now have some time to answer some of your questions, but please remember that you can contact us at any point via the international peer review email address and we can help you with points of clarity about the review process, questions about conflicts and other elements that you may wish to ask about. So we will be collating all of your questions and the questions from the other two um, webinars. We're running the same webinar um, three times over today for people in different time zones. Uh, so all those questions will be pulled together um, and put onto the website. Um, so if you do think of any further questions, um, then please do let us know and we'll include those. We'll conclude there in that, that point. Um, so I'd like to thank you for joining us uh, for this UKRI International Development Peer Review College webinar. Uh, we hope you found the webinar useful um, and we would appreciate your feedback um, to help us improve future webinars and a feedback form uh, survey will be sent out to you uh, tomorrow. So do look out for that. A recording of today's webinar will be made available available in the coming days. If you have any further questions about any of the points um, that Anne and Sean have raised today, uh, please email internationalpeerreview at rcuk.ac.uk. Uh, thank you once again for joining us and we look forward to working with you in the UKRI International Development Peer Review College.